On today's hot zone, Yuma, Arizona declares a state of emergency on the U.S. southern border. An American missionary is murdered in Paraguay, and the Israel Defense Force take it to Hamas. That's coming up. Stick around for the hot zone. This is the hot zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, thanks for being a part of the Hot Zone podcast today. It is just too nice an afternoon to be in the house, so I didn't even bother setting up the studio or anything. I'm just out in the backyard and I'm going to do it out here. Uh, Yesterday on the story, I talked about Drew Paisler and we interviewed him. He survived the ambush in Haiti and we're going to be doing more reporting on this attack. I really highly recommend you go back and watch yesterday's podcast. There have been some other interesting developments in that country that are basically being ignored that we're going to talk about uh, that aren't being reported in the rest of the media. So next week, I'm going to go meet with the men who were involved in that attack and I'm going to get their stories and really do the right job with a real camera. So I hope you'll stay tuned for that. All right, let's talk about what's going on in Paraguay. Uh, I've never been to Paraguay and I didn't realize it was such a hot zone, but there was an American Christian missionary shot and killed last week in the village where he was serving in the southern part of that country. His name is Wayne Goddard and he's a missionary for Ethnos 360, which is an international missions agency that we've supported for many years. As I heard that on the news, I went and looked it up and I was really shocked. Wayne was only 50 years old. He's been working with various indigenous tribes for over 25 years in that area of Paraguay. Now, I don't have a lot of details about exactly what happened, but it appears at this point to have been perhaps a botched robbery attempt or something like that. Uh, One suspect has apparently been arrested in, in, in conjunction with the attack, and hopefully they'll be able to bring to justice the perpetrators. The local authorities are gonna continue investigating. Ethnos 360 started out as New Tribes Mission, and they've been around since the start of World War II, or thereabouts. Uh, we've interviewed people from New Tribes for a long time. They have about 2,500 missionaries all over the globe, mostly serving in very remote places, among tribes who don't really have their own copy of the Bible. So they have to do biblical translation. My wife and I have supported, for example, Terry and Renee Reed, some friends of ours in Mexico, who are new tribes missionaries to the Huarihiro people, uh, a small indigenous tribe in central Mexico, right among the prime pot growing region that's controlled by the cartel. So that makes life interesting. We've also known and supported other new tribes missionaries here in Panama and The bottom line is that the work these people do is really absolutely vital, especially when you think in light of eternity. So it's really a tragedy that Wayne Goddard was murdered down there uh, because these guys really improve the lives of people in very remote places who in very many cases don't have any idea of things like forgiveness and redemption. And that's what the Bible brings to a culture. You can see that throughout history around the globe. Wherever Christianity comes in for the first time, the plight of the people gets better, especially their weakest, the women, the children, the, the you know, in, aged and infirm. All right, let's move on to Israel. So I really would rather not talk about Minnesota Congressional Representative Ilhan Omar. She's been in the news a lot lately for anti-Semitic comments she's made just over and over again. It's almost like she really just doesn't quite get how hateful her messages are. But without a doubt, she is deeply entrenched in the anti-Israel left and the ideology of what they call BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Now, the last time I was in Israel, we made a package about the BDS movement and what Israel's doing to try to counter it. It featured my friend, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North and Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, who's not my favorite person, but I think he's doing the right thing in this case. Check it out. This is the historic King David Hotel in the heart of Jerusalem. What you're about to see inside is a program that's gonna change things for the good, hopefully for Israel and the USA. Here's what's happened. There's a program begun by the far left in Europe called BDS. stands for boycott. 
divest and sanction. It's all an economic attack on Israel, trying to force them to make accommodations that wouldn't be good for Israel or the United States. But the governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan, is about to sign a document opening a trade agreement between Israel and the state of Maryland. It could set the example for the rest of the U.S. and maybe even in Europe. The goal of our trade mission has been to strengthen the ties between Maryland and Israeli officials and business leaders. We are committed to creating a culture in our state where all businesses can grow and thrive. And in this increasingly competitive economy where companies can and do locate virtually anywhere, we are looking beyond our borders for more opportunities. Give us a sense for what businesses you see as prospering from this, both here and home. Well, we already have 24 Israeli companies headquartered in Maryland, and uh, we, we uh, signed deals with about four or five more since we've been here, mostly in the uh, cyber, security, and defense industries, but also in uh, biotech, biohealth kinds of things where Maryland is strong, and so are they strong here in Israel. A sense that you may be setting an example for other governors in, in the United States. Well, I don't know. I'm not really trying to set an example for anybody. We're just doing what we think is the right thing to do. Um, this has been a tremendous week for us, uh, business-wise, but also culturally, uh, just getting to know uh, some really good friends here in Israel. From Jerusalem, I'm Oliver North for NRA TV. Now, Ilhan Omar has been consistently supporting groups like the Council on American-Islamic Relations, which is also known as CARE. Uh, CARE has been tied without question to the terror group Hamas in the Gaza Strip and elsewhere. They're a publicity and fundraising wing of that terrorist organization. Now, just so you understand a little bit about who Hamas really is, I want to show you a couple of videos about that organization that were produced by the people who have to deal with Hamas a lot, the Israeli Defense Forces. I'm right now standing in front of the opening to a Hamas terror tunnel located just meters away from a civilian community here in southern Israel, Ein Shlusha. This tunnel is one that is not built for humanitarian aid to smuggle goods or anything along those lines. This is a tunnel built by Hamas for one clear goal, to commit acts of terror against the civilians that are living in this area. This tunnel originated in Khan Yunus and extends into Israel for more than a mile. You can see here are wires along the side of the tunnels. These are used for electricity, and other tunnels that we found even had phone wires. These are tunnels that are built with high-quality cement, cement that comes into Gaza from Israel as humanitarian aid. On average, every one of these tunnels costs roughly $3 million. Multiply that by the amount of tunnels that we found, and that leads to about $100 million that could have been invested in schools, in community centers, in hospitals, in mosques in the Gaza Strip. This tunnel and others like it clearly reflect Hamas's priorities. Rather than invest time and resources in the population of Gaza, Hamas instead chooses to invest in acts of terror against the Israeli public. This is the true face of Hamas. Now, I think it's absolutely astounding that we have an ardent supporter of CARE, a literal terrorist supporting organization serving in the U.S. House of Representatives. To make matters worse, she's regularly making speeches calling the five million men and women who support the Second Amendment and belong to the National Rifle Association a terrorist group. So the irony there is just a little too thick, so you'll have to forgive me for getting political for a moment. What's even more annoying is how the left tries to attack anybody who criticizes Representative Omar for her incendiary rhetoric. I mean, shouldn't we be able to use our freedom of speech to say we disagree with what she's saying. And they say our criticism is inciting violence when she's supporting Hamas and Hamas is calling for and engaging in violence very literally on a daily basis. It's one of those things that just kind of leaves you shaking your head and wondering how somebody's worldview can get so out of whack with reality. Now, speaking about out of whack with reality, let's move on to San Francisco. Uh, today's the anniversary of the great San Francisco earthquake of 1906, which was absolutely incredible tragedy. Massive 7.9 earthquake, which killed as many as 3,000 people and devastated most of San Francisco. It was definitely one of the worst natural disasters our country has ever seen, without a doubt. But San Francisco rose from the ashes and it was rebuilt into an absolutely beautiful city with amazing architecture and parks 
and all kinds of other beautiful tourist attractions that I used to go see when I was a kid. Well, unfortunately, much of that has been literally sullied by an epidemic of homelessness and drug use on the streets of San Francisco. I went out there last year to do some reporting on that subject, and I was unfortunate enough to be there just in time for a massive natural disaster I would call the Gay Rights Parade. Now, to say I'd rather be dodging bullets in Somalia or running through Dubai with a sign on my back that says, I'm gay and I'm here to convert all of you, uh, is an understatement. But let me tell you, I've been around the world, I've seen a lot of things, and I pretty much thought I had seen it all, but I was wrong. And the things that I had not seen yet, I didn't want to see. Now, as you watch this footage, just bear in mind that this is the, a picture of the America that the left wants to export to the rest of our country. That they would love nothing more than for the entire country to be just like San Francisco, which for me is all the reason I'll ever need to homeschool my children and never vote for a liberal candidate, of course, for any reason ever. But I hope you'll just forgive me because I really don't like to go into just my opinion. I, I want this to be about reporting to you things that you don't hear in the rest of the news. But I think if you had walked around San Francisco that day with me, you might feel the same way. I'm just trying to show you what the city of San Francisco looks like today, and believe me, it's not pretty. Now, the bottom line is this. While that city has a massive budget and a huge tax base, it's an absolute mess due to the socialist, redistributionist, and ultra-leftist extremist policies that have been put in place by the city council and the mayor out there. So that's enough of that. Let's move on to Yuma, Arizona, which is also a mess, but for a different reason. They're declaring a state of emergency in that town and warning of migrant mobs roaming, roaming the streets and clashing with residents looking to satisfy their basic human needs like food and shelter. The mayor, whose name is Douglas Nichols, said the migrants are being released by the Border Patrol so fast that they're overwhelming the local shelters and churches and other assets that are meant to sustain those people. Uh, now, this is a real unfortunate reality that we're seeing all along the U.S. southern border, as I've reported on a lot over the last couple of weeks. And if I can delve once more into my opinion, I won't do this a lot, I promise. I think this is, might actually be a good thing for our country in the end, because for the very reason that it was a good thing for you know, Europe, in that it pushed the European voter base much further to the right than it otherwise would have been. So I take, for example, I went last year across Europe reporting on this subject. And in Italy, what I found was the migrant crisis was making people vote much more to the right than they normally would have. So now we're seeing a similar, similar problems in the United States. And there's a fair chance that it'll result in a right word shift in maybe maybe even another four-year term for Donald Trump. It's kind of paradoxical because in reality, the Trump ran on the, the migrant crisis, and it's much worse now than it was when he took office. But I think most Trump voters will, won't blame him for what's happened because they can see that he's done everything he can to try to stop the migration crisis. But he's been stymied at every turn by liberal judges and politicians that are doing everything they can to maintain open borders. And as for the migrants, they can see that we're a house divided against ourselves. And you know what the Bible says about a house divided? It can't stand. So the migrants are taking advantage of that to get while they're getting is good. All right, that's all the bad news I have for today. Now, how about some good news? So if you might remember the last time I was in Venezuela on, over in the border with Colombia in Cucuta, I met Catherine and her two little kids. We did a little interview with her, all in Spanish. She told me she was working as a porter. She had to literally fight other much younger boys to get loads that she could carry across the river into Venezuela every day. And while she was gone at work carrying those heavy loads, her kids were playing in the streets with no supervision. So for that, she was earning about a dollar a day, which was just barely enough to get them a space to sleep on somebody's floor so they didn't have to sleep out on the street. Now, there are soup kitchens in that area that serve two meals a day where they could eat, but in order to eat, you have to get in line. And the lines are so long that it can take up to two hours or more out of your day just to get something to eat. So if Catherine wants to make any money, she really doesn't have the time to go stand in that line, and hence, she's not eating very well. 
And so I'm maybe getting one meal a day and that's about it. So as you can imagine, the soup kitchen is feeding 8,000 people. And so it's probably not gonna be the best, highest quality, most nutritious food possible. And so the one meal or so she's getting every day is really taking a toll on her body. So I wanted to help Catherine. And with your assistance and the money that our Patreon subscribers have donated, uh, I was able to do that today. I was able to get Catherine enough money so that she can absolutely change her life. She can change her situation and actually start her own little business where she'll be able to sell products and make more than she was making before and not have to leave her children in the process. They'll be able to stay there with her during the day. Now I'm gonna keep up with Catherine and I'll update you as I get news from her about how it's going. But I just wanna say thank you from her and from me, for those of you who've donated, because you really are making a difference. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of hurting people just like Catherine in that area alone, much less around the rest of the world. And it can feel overwhelming when you think about it that way. But when you look at those two little kids that Catherine takes care of, that she's watching and caring for all on her own, and you can lay your head down at night and know that you did something good to help those little kids and better their lives, well, I guess that's enough. And I guess for me, I can just trust God to take care of the rest. I hope you can too. So as I always say, we don't have to help them all. We just have to help the ones that God puts in front of us. And that's what we're trying to do here on the Hot Zone podcast. So thanks for making the news a little better for Catherine and for her family. And I hope you'll continue to watch and share this podcast with your friends. So until tomorrow, I'm Chuck Holton. Thanks for watching. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.